So we've done uh, an introduction. Now we're going to look at uh, start looking at the nuts and bolts of chemistry. Uh, atoms, molecules, and ions form the basis of everything that's happening on the microscopic level. Recording, yes. Probably ought to get over here so I'm in frame. Okay. Um, we'll start off with laws. Remember, we talked about what a law is. It just says this is what happens. If these conditions are at the beginning, then these will be at the end. We don't know why. It's like a black box. Put something <laughs> in and something else spits out. They're actually pieces of equipment and uh, that will do that. And you don't know what's going on inside. That always bugged me. We had a, a, an analyzer in the lab I used to work at called a near-infrared spectrometer. And if you put your samples into it, usually ground plant samples, put them in there, and it would shine infrared light at it in a certain wavelength range. And then it would, it would run the reflected light uh, through an algorithm, which is a fancy name for uh, mathematical magic. And it would spit out a number saying the concentration of various components. But nobody knew what was happening inside. Yeah. So that, that's kind of like a law. It just happens. We don't know why. But it is true, right? As long as you don't stray too far from the initial conditions. So this law, the law of conservation of mass, is pretty old. It's like back before the French Revolution. So if you know your history, that's like the late 1800s. It was shortly after the American Revolution. In fact, the American Revolution was part of the cause for the French Revolution. It weakened the monarchy of France, and then the, the radicals took over. Anyway, Lavoisier uh, was pretty wealthy. He was like a, a gentleman scientist, and his, his wife was pretty sharp, too. She helped him. And um, uh, he came up with some pretty good ideas. Uh, it's a good thing he did them, uh, published them before the French Revolution rolled around because um, he had purchased a license from the crown to collect taxes. And right, even back then, nobody likes tax collectors. But they get really nasty during the French Revolution with tax collectors. In fact, uh, Lavoisier lost his head over it. So that was the end of his career. The law of conservation of mass. Very simple, it just says during a chemical reaction, the mass of the reactants is equal to the mass of the products. In other words, you don't create mass, you don't destroy mass in the process. Okay. Um, then Proust came along a little bit later, uh, exactly when I can't remember. Law of definite proportions. He just said that uh, any compound. Um, that you isolate, purify, has to be a pure substance. It doesn't matter where it comes from, what the source, it will always contain exactly the same proportion of elements by mass. Okay. So for instance, if you have, um, I mean, if you're wearing a fireproof suit and you collect the exhaust from the space shuttle when it's going off, then you'll have the products of hydrogen gas reacting with oxygen gas to yield water. And at that time, of course, it'd be a gas because it's so hot. Let's see, I should balance this equation, shouldn't I? We'll talk about that later too. But the product here is water, right? It has a proportion of hydrogen to oxygen by mass. And in those days, that's all they knew. They only knew mass. They didn't know about numbers of atoms. That would come a little bit later. But you can also get water as a product of um, acid-base reaction. Right? If I put uh, sodium hydroxide together with, let's see, HCl, let's keep it simple, hydrochloric acid, sodium hydroxide, then you'll get sodium chloride plus water. 
Okay, so Proust said that uh, the proportions of hydrogen to oxygen by mass in each one of these products is the same, exactly the same. It doesn't matter how you how you come up with it, or whether you just purify water from the ocean. <laughs> doesn't matter. It's always the same. Okay, now the next one is one that kind of gets confused with this one. This is the law of definite proportions. Then Dalton, a little bit later, came up with the law of multiple proportions. Okay, so don't let that fool you. Don't that they're they're related, but they're not. If that makes any sense, the law of multiple proportions simply says. If you have two elements that form a compound, but uh, those two elements can form different compounds. For instance, if you have nitrogen and oxygen together, that's a compound. Right? We've identified it, it's uh, in the books. Well, if you do uh, NO2, that's a different compound. Or if you do NO3, that's a different compound. What Dalton said was that the ratio, right, you hold this one constant. So you've got one gram of nitrogen out of these different compounds. You hold that constant. As long as you can identify one gram each, then each one of these is going to be a whole number multiple of the one before. So I'd have to do some calculations to tell you what that is. If this is one gram, then what's that? Well, if this is just for argument's sake, if, if oxygen is X grams, then this oxygen in that uh, compound is going to be two X grams. And this one's going to be three X grams. As long as we hold this one constant at one gram. So that's multiple proportions. It's always a whole number multiple in a, in a series like that. We call that a homologous series. Okay. So that's the way I explain it. If we read it black and white, when two elements form a series of compounds, like these, the ratios of the masses of the second element that combine with one gram of the first element can always be reduced to small whole numbers. That is the ratio from this one to this one to this one is always a whole number multiple. That's multiple proportions as opposed to definite proportions, which just says it doesn't matter where the compound comes from, it's always going to have the same proportion mass mass of the elements in the compound. Okay, so those are three pivotal laws that were used to uh, springboard into modern chemistry. Dalton, you'll see Dalton again. <clears throat> In fact, next slide. <clears throat> uh, Dalton's atomic theory uh, jumped off from ancient Greece. The ancient Greeks believed that everything was made of uh, an elementary particle, a very smallest particle beyond which you cannot get any smaller. And they called it the atom. Did I show you guys this one? I can't remember one class to the next. They called it the atom. In Greek, um, the prefix a means not. It's the, it's the opposite of the root. So this is not. And tomos is the Greek root word, which means cut or divide. So it, it's not cut. You can't make it any smaller. That's why they call it the atom. Now, when the Greeks, when the ancient Greeks first came up with this, they, the ones who did it were in the minority. Most of the people agreed with Aristotle that everything was made of uh, wind, uh, earth, fire, and water in different proportions. Of course, he turned out to be wrong. <clears throat> but the ones who proposed the atom were on the right course, only they didn't go far enough because they said everything was made of the same atoms. And that being said, they couldn't explain why 
that substance was different than that substance, that they're all made of the same stuff. So they, they come up with all kinds of different uh, tweaks to their theory to try to explain why that was. But it wasn't until Dalton came along that we started getting on the right road. Dalton said that, yeah, everything's made of small, indivisible parts called atoms. But when you've identified an element, like any one of these elements, the atom of one element is different than the atom of the other element. That's all he had to do, just say that. And the, the, the huge number of problems created by the ancient Greeks were solved immediately. Okay. Um, he also said that the atoms of the any given element were identical. Right? So that's where he kind of went off the rails. And I'll show you why in a few minutes. Now, chemically speaking, yeah, they react the same way. Every atom of this element reacts the same way as every other element. But they're not identical. And when we get to the discussion of isotopes, I'll explain why. Okay, he also said in his atomic theory that, um, and this explains, remember the laws just say what happened, the theory says why. This explains why um, the law of conservation of mass is true. Because during the chemical reaction, <coughs> atoms are just shuffled around, they're, they're moved. They just swap partners. They break bonds and they recreate bonds to make new substances, new compounds. Okay, that's why if you got the same number of atoms going in as the same number of atoms going out, that means the same mass. Okay, so all you have to do is just rearrange. So that's, that's another premise of Dalton's atomic theory. And that we're also gonna come back to that when we balance equations. Well, I erased them, but that's why I put those, those uh, coefficients in front of the compounds and the elements, because that's how you balance equations, but we'll get there. Um, okay, I already said that. What was the previous one? Oh, okay. I was, I was putting two premises together. <laughs> compounds are formed, chemical compounds are formed when uh, atoms combine, right? And you get a different identity, right? Hydrogen is a gas and it's flammable. Oxygen is a gas and it supports combustion. But water does neither. So they have different identities. And the reason water has a different identity is because the hydrogen and oxygen combine to form a compound. Now the compound uh, has a new name, has a new identity. And then chemical reactions are, like I said, just rearrange the atoms. Um, now, after, after Dalton proposed that theory, we got a little history lesson going on here. The um, modern chemistry was based primarily upon investigation of gases. And there's good reason for that. Um, most people understood gases. Now, alchemy during the Dark Ages was more like, a, it's like going to a cookbook. You don't know why the recipe works. You just know you want that recipe because it makes some good looking, good tasting food. But you don't really know why. You need, a, you need a degree like I've got in food science to figure out why it works the way it does. But that aside, uh, the alchemists were like that. They just had recipes. And they knew how to uh, isolate mineral acids. They knew all about hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, nitric acid. And they knew a lot of the elements that we have on our table. But they had no clue why things worked the way they did. In fact, they were very secretive. In other words, the only one who acquired their secret knowledge was the apprentice. Um, but modern chemistry is based upon another premise where you want to publish your information to as many people as possible. And you want it scrutinized by everybody because 
then overall, you want science to advance. You want the truth to come out. You don't want to hide anything. Most scientists that way. Some scientists, you know, they still want to hide things or they want to change them, change the outcome of their experiments to suit their preconceived notions. And they, they're referring particularly to climate scientists. But uh, back to the gases. <clears throat> Work on gases uh, began what we know now as, as modern chemistry, primarily because uh, gases behave in many cases as if it doesn't matter what the gas is, right? Oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, um, water vapor. They all behave the same way under certain conditions. So you could conduct experiments even with mixed gases like air. The first ga uh, gas experiments were done with just plain air. <clears throat> the reason they, they behave so much alike, and this I'm referring to as an ideal gas, the reason they behave so much alike is because the molecules are so far apart. Compared to the size of the, of the molecule or atom of the gas, the distance between it and the next one is huge. They've got lots of room. So what we often refer to a gas is uh, the molecule is a point volume. Remember in math, when you, when you have no dimensions, no width, no length, no depth, that's what you do, you just put a point. If you've got a length, you draw a line. If you've got two dimensions, you draw like a box or something like that. And if you've got three dimensions, you, know, you improvise. <laughs> so that's three dimensions. Well, for gases, they behave as if they don't have a volume. Now, as long as the pressure is low and you have uh, one atmosphere or less, or actually 10 or 20 atmospheres is okay, um, and the temperature is high enough, then the gases don't interact significantly. As in other words, they don't uh, attract each other when they come close together, and they don't repel each other when they come close. They just act like billiard balls, they just bounce off each other. So that's why gases were uh, useful for the first investigations of chemistry, because you didn't have to be concerned with the actual chemistry. In other words, these laws are, to begin with, are mostly physical. We're talking about physics, not chemistry. But the investigations of, especially these two, Guy Lussac and Avogadro, uh, were instrumental in, well, Guy Lussac did do some chemistry. Avogadro did do some chemistry, but they were, they were investigating physical properties too. Uh, their investigations uh, jump started the chemical industry in Europe. And I'll explain in a minute. Uh, Gay Lussac measured the volumes of gases that reacted with each other. So he was concerned with reactions, but he, he couldn't quite explain uh, the results. Let's see. I don't want to steal my own thunder. Let me check my hard copy. Uh, yeah. Okay. So the next slides will go into that. And then I'll talk about Avogadro in a minute. Um, let's, let's do Gay Lussac first. So he noticed that at the same temperature and pressure, that two volumes of hydrogen combined with one volume of oxygen. And in chemistry, uh, one plus one doesn't always equal two, or two plus one in this case doesn't equal three. Two plus one equals two. So these Two volumes of hydrogen and one volume of oxygen equals two volumes of water, gaseous water at the same temperature and pressure. So let me pause for a moment. When we describe a gas, you need four measurements to completely describe a gas without referencing what the compound is or what the element is. You need to know the pressure, you need to know the temperature, the volume, and how much of it there are, how many particles, right? That's my abbreviation for moles. We haven't defined moles yet, so just take my word for it. That's the number of gas particles. So if you know the, all these four conditions, you have completely described a gas uh, at one level, and you haven't, of course, gone down to the chemical level yet. This is all physics. But what Gay Lussac did was he held 
pressure and temperature together, and then he investigated the volumes. He didn't really know about this yet. He didn't know about uh, numbers of particles. That was Avogadro's stroke of genius. Uh, occasionally, uh, one plus one does equal two, but he couldn't explain why. Okay. Now we know that two plus one equals two because two particles here, which we refer to as two volumes, plus one volume of oxygen combines to form two molecules of water, which means two volumes. What Avogadro said was the reason for that is that these two are related. If you hold these two and the volume is doubled, then the number of particles is doubled. Okay, uh, that's hydrogen and chlorine coming together. All right, let me back up. Avogadro. <clears throat> Avogadro was Italian, and he did the initial work on what I'm about to describe. Uh, but in Europe, about, well, by 1860, the chemical industry of Europe was just on the verge of exploding, taking off which means profits. <clears throat> so uh, the universities and the chemical industries would run along okay, because all they knew was mass. Combine this mass of that reactant, this mass of that reactant, you usually get a mass of uh, marketable product. But when things went wrong, their engineers didn't know how to fix it because they really didn't understand what the reaction was, what reaction was happening at the microscopic level. So they all convened in 1860 at a little southern Bavarian town called Karlsruhe. There's a small college there. So they figured that'd be kind of out of the way and nobody'd be looking over their shoulders. And they said, okay, we're going to put our heads together and solve this problem right here and now. So they were there for four or five days. And uh, now that's at the end, they just threw up their hands. Said, we don't know what's going on. What they didn't realize was that one of the papers that was delivered at that conference was based upon Avogadro's work and Avogadro's hypothesis, which I'll explain in a minute. And it was done by uh, a student of Avogadro's. His name was Canizaro. Uh, Zaro. I think that's how you spell it. But he delivered a paper that he had published on this topic, and he gave credit for the original idea to Avogadro, his mentor. And he was handing out reprints at the end of the meeting. So he gave his talk, and it's like everybody was snoozing. So he gave his talk, and to be sure that they got the point, he handed out reprints as they were leaving the meeting. And they politely took copies back to their universities and, and uh, factories. And some of them read it and the, the light bulbs started going on all over the earth. They finally knew how to fix the problem. Okay, here's what, here's what Avogadro said. Those four factors I mentioned before, Avogadro said, if you have, think of this as a sphere containing a gas. So if you have that gas and this gas, and these volumes are equal, okay? The pressure inside there of the gas is also equal, okay? And the temperatures are equal. What else is equal? The number of particles in that sphere are exactly the same as the number in that sphere if these conditions are met. And it doesn't matter what the gas is. Okay. So, what is not the same for each one, unless it's exactly the same gas? If this were, uh, let's keep it simple. Let's say, uh, say this one is uh, helium 
and this one is neon. Okay. So for argument's sake, let's say this one uh, weighs four grams. That means this one weighs 20 grams. Okay. Why is this one heavier than that one? Why does it, why does it have more mass than that one? If there's the same number of particles in there, it has to be due because each one of the atoms here weighs five times as much as that one. Now you can relate masses to numbers of particles. And that's when they started to figure out what the reactions were actually happening uh, in their factories and in their colleges and universities. When things went wrong, they were closer to the answer. Okay, we'll, we'll come back to that at some point. All right, um, so let's see, we've got Gay-Lussac, Avogadro. Now we're gonna find out what atoms are made of, right? Uh, not cut is only partially true. An atom has an identity. Right? Uh, neon is different than helium. That's different than hydrogen. It's different than oxygen. It's different than gold, each of the atoms. But, these atoms are made up of smaller particles. Now, once you access those smaller particles, you don't have those elements anymore. Right? So if you want that, the atom of that element, it has to be a certain structure. It has to have those subatomic particles in the correct ratio. So now we're gonna look at the subatomic particles. What actually makes up an atom? And we're gonna begin with J.J. Thompson. He was an Englishman. Uh, operating around the turn of the 20th century, just on the just the dawn of the 20th of this 20th century, he worked with. Uh, at this time, electricity was just. I think the the ancient term is all the rage. Everybody wanted electricity, even if their their soirees, their parties, they would have static electricity. Batteries had been invented, like right? Volta had admit, invented the. Uh, uh, a pile of different metals together with electrolytes between them and, and you hold the two ends like that get a big shock everybody loved that that they had static electricity generators somebody crank a wheel one of the servants and it would build up a static charge and then uh the person that was holding on to it before the charge started uh, would be at the same charge as the device and everybody would hold hands and then the first one in the row would touch this guy, or they would just reach out and touch the device, and everybody in the row would just <laughs> get a shock, and that was the life of the party. <clears throat> well, some some people, these scientists, actually did something with that knowledge. J.J. Thompson was working with a cathode ray tube, which is a device that is evacuated, almost completely evacuated. Sometimes it has a uh, very low pressure gas in it. And you have uh, high voltage uh, running through it and two plates inside the chamber and they would and it would um, uh, send charged particles from one to the other through that space. Now, if there was a little bit of gas in there, uh, like uh, do they still make neon lights? You want to talk neon lights? OK, uh, those rarefied uh, noble gases. In those tubes, depending on what they are, they produce a different color. And they're they're not atmospheric pressure; they're very low pressure. There's just a just a few atoms in there, but it's enough, right? High voltage at one end of that tube, and it sends it down to the other electrode at the other end of the tube, and excites those atoms inside, and they give off light. So the cathode ray tube was was also uh, used for investigations, and um, J. J. Thompson postulated and then proved with his experiments that the elementary particle that was traveling from one end to the other was negatively charged. Okay. And he said that any material can produce it. It's common to all materials. He called it the electron. And eventually he determined that the charge ratio between the electron's charge and its mass. <clears throat> 
He, did, he wasn't able to determine the exact mass of the electron, but he knew it was pretty light. He just determined the, the ratio of charge to mass. Okay, so now we have the electron, right? So if atoms, any atom can produce electrons, there must be some positive in there somewhere to balance the charge. They knew enough then that positives and negatives had to balance. So he said, okay, there's a, um, uh, inside the atom, there are positive charges that balance all these negatives that I'm producing in my instrument. And he came up with the plum pudding model of the atom. He said, okay, the atoms have to be this. He knows that there are negative particles in here somewhere. The electron. So he said, we have to have an equal number of positives somewhere. He says, I don't know what they are. So I said, it's like these electrons are floating in pudding, positive pudding. Plum pudding has, uh, I don't know if it's raisins or currants, you know, scattered throughout. So that was his model for the atom. But we've got to start somewhere. And that's a, this is a, a recreation of his cathode ray tube. He would apply uh, electric fields on either side and bend the beam. And then apply magnetic fields and bend the beam also. And he knew based upon how charges, moving charges behaved in magnetic and electric fields, he could deduce that the particles were negative. Oh, sorry. Oh, God, I got a video for you. sounded computer generated to me <laughs> especially when they got to uh, 0. 0.0001 millimeters hg we would have said millimeters of mercury anyway <clears throat> so um that's jj thompson's contribution um robert milliken um not too long after thompson did his work was a um, University professor in the United States. I think he was Harvard. Don't hold me to that. He performed experiments with an instrument that he built himself. And uh, these oil drop experiments were conducted by uh, spraying very fine droplets of oil into a vacuum chamber and through a charged grid upon which he knew that electrons would be deposited on the oil props. 
Uh, and then he allowed those oil drops to drift under gravity into the uh, electric field. And he knew based upon the, the potential difference, the strength of the field between the two plates and the influence of gravity, this compli complicated uh, uh, mathematical formula. He could deduce the mass of the electron. And he did this experiment thousands of times, right? Every, every moment, whenever he had spare time, he'd just go in the lab and, and run a test. And he ran them over and over and over again. And he had criteria, uh, the basis upon which he knew when he could, uh, it was valid to reject a number. And what he found was that the, uh, the charge on these oil drops was uh, a whole number unit. If he determined the charge on the old drop was this value, then the other one might be twice that or three times that or four times that or even half that. But eventually he uh, accumulated enough data that he determined the mass of the electron was 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. So yeah, it's pretty small. And he got a Nobel prize for it in physics in 1923. So he did his work in, in the early 1900s and it took him 20 years to decide that it was worth a Nobel, which is typical. Nobel usually uh, needs uh, field testing of your theories or your discoveries in order to see if they're worth the prize. So by the time you get the prize and the money that goes along with it, you're probably retired and don't need it. Uh, okay. Oh, we got another video. I need to start it. In a series of experiments carried out between 1908 and 1917, Ari Milliken succeeded in measuring the charge of the electron with great precision. In his experiment, a fine mist of oil was sprayed into the upper chamber with an atomizer. Some of the tiny oil droplets fell through the hole in the upper floor, and Milliken was able to determine the mass of an oil drop from its terminal velocity. Next, Milliken used an X-ray source to ionize gas molecules in the chamber. Electrons from this ionization process adhere to the oil droplets. The oil droplets now carry a negative charge. The negatively charged oil droplets can be halted by adjusting the voltage across the two plates. As the voltage across the plates is increased, the velocity of the oil drops slows. As the voltage is increased further, some drops will begin to move upward toward the positive plate. If the voltage is set just right, an oil drop can be suspended. When an oil drop is suspended, its weight, mass times acceleration due to gravity, is exactly counterbalanced by the electric force applied. The electric force applied equals the applied electric field, E, times the charge on the drop, Q. Since the mass of the oil drop, the acceleration due to gravity, and the applied electric field are known, Millikan could solve for Q, which is the charge on the drop. Milliken found that droplets had different charges, but each was a whole number multiple of a smaller charge equal to negative 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. Milliken concluded that this was the fundamental unit of charge, the charge of an electron. From the charge of an electron and the charge to mass ratio of an electron determined by Thompson using a cathode ray tool, Milliken was able to calculate the mass of an electron. The mass of an electron, 9.10 times 10 to the negative 28 grams, is an exceedingly small mass. Is that it? That's it. <clears throat> Notice that that value that uh, Millikan determined is different than the one that was just quoted. Uh, here. Well, that was in grams. No, this is right. Thank you, Dave. This is in kilograms, that was in grams. So the difference between the two is three orders of magnitude, which is the difference between minus 28 and minus 31. Okay, so they agree. Okay, so that takes care of the mass of the electron. But that still wasn't the whole story. What we needed now was the discoverer of radioactivity. How are we doing on time? Okay, I got about 20 minutes. We might have to, might have to use that buffer day. <laughs>
which would be Thursday. Because I don't want to skimp on this topic. Uh, he was French, so he pronounced it Henri. Henri Becquerel. <laughs> um, discovered radioactivity by observing the spontaneous emission of radiation by uranium. Right? But these researchers with radioactivity didn't realize just how dangerous that stuff is. Um, but be that as it may, eventually um, three primary types of radiation were identified. One of them was um, electromagnetic, in other words, light. That's the gamma ray. And this is the small Greek letter gamma. So those are gamma rays. They're very high energy light. And they all come from the nucleus of the atom. Right? I'm using a term I haven't even defined yet. There's also beta particles. Beta particles were discovered to be nothing more than electrons. But they're very high speed electrons. They're originating also from the nucleus. Uh, the beta particles. And the last one was alpha particles. Alpha particles were also originating from the nucleus, but they turned out to be uh, ionized helium nuclei. Right? So we got these three types. And uh, in order of mass, this is the heaviest one. This is the lightest particle. And then that one has no mass. Well, technically speaking. Because if, you, if you talk to Einstein, he'll tell you, well, they have a mass equivalent. Uh, equals mc squared. So if you know the mass, you know the energy that it carries, uh, equivalent energy that it can be converted into. That's another story. But they have these particles available. This one is the one we need to focus on because it's going to be instrumental in the next discovery of um, elementary particles. Ernest Rutherford was an Englishman uh, shortly thereafter who postulated that this plum pudding model he didn't believe it he said that it's more likely that and this is where you, the hypothesis comes in i don't know where he got this hypothesis but he said okay i'm gonna say instead of this those positives are actually particles but they're actually uh, they have to have mass, right? And he knew they had to be extremely massive compared to the electrons because the mass of the atom was too large for all the electrons that it would have. You can't have enough electrons to come and account for all mass in an atom. So he said, I'm going to propose another theory. And this was his nuclear theory. He said that the nucleus was very small, very dense. That's where all the positive charges are located, in here somewhere. And then the electrons are out here somewhere. Since the electrons have very little mass, if I shoot some particle at these atoms, then most of them will go straight through and hit the other side. Well, the same thing would happen over here. If it's so diffuse, then they would go straight through and, and not be, they might be slowed down, but they wouldn't be deflected. So he said, that's where they both agree. But where they don't agree is if one of the particles I fire at this model strikes a nucleus, it'll either go like that, or it'll go like that, bouncing off of it, or it could go straight back. So he said, now I have a hypothesis I'm going to devise an experiment to test it. So Rutherford's gold foil experiment was like this. Oh, there's no narration. I, I guess I better talk. But I don't have a pause button. Let me pause and describe it for a little bit. Back up. There we go. 
<clears throat> okay, so what Rutherford did was he took this, it's kind of hard to see, and he took this box, which was lead lined. In other words, it absorbed all radiation from the radioactive source. And I'm not sure what he used, but his radioactive source emitted alpha particles. You know, the, the really heavy ones, he needed something heavy. So that if it struck the nucleus, there would be a noticeable uh, influence on the size. It was comparable to the size of the nucleus. And then uh, these two plates are called collimators. If you want a straight beam, then the beam has to pass through this slit. Oops. And that slit. If it comes in from this way, it could come in like this and go that way. It could come in like this and go that way. It will be stopped by this plate. The only way that you can go through both of them is in a straight line. They're lined up, so the alpha particles have to go in a straight line. He needed that straight line particles because once he fired them at the gold foil right here, then uh, if they were if there was a white beam, then he couldn't tell if it was just because of the beam that the detector around here was picking up those uh, flashes or uh, exposures on the film couldn't tell with a wide beam whether it was due to his experiment or whether it was just due to a, a, a broad scatter. So now he had this collimated beam and he fired it through this little slit in the circle and it, and it hit the gold foil. Now, why did he use gold foil? It seemed like he could have used something cheaper. Well, uh, thin gold foil was very easy to obtain in those days. People knew how to make very thin foil. Gold, you can hammer it. You just put it between two pieces of leather and just smack it all day long. You know, hire somebody two cents an hour to, to bang on it, and it makes it very thin. Like the gold on the state capitol in Charleston, just a few ounces. That's all it takes. It's so thin. And he needed something really thin because he only wanted a few atoms there. Right? He didn't want to have a lot of atoms because then it would stop the whole beam and nothing would come through. So he said, I, need, I just need a very few atoms thin to fire my alpha particles at it. So he did. And what did he discover? Well, okay, let's, let's continue. They, don't, they might tell us what that material is. No. Just an alpha particle emitter. Okay, there's your straight beam. Through the door, through the gold. And that's what he obtained. Actually, that shows more, most of them, the vast majority of them went straight through and hit the other side, straight line. So that's a little more than you expect to see. But some of them did deflect off to one side, and some of them bounced straight back. There you go. There, when it strikes the nucleus, the nucleus is so massive in comparison to the rest of the atom. That gold is, is it's extremely massive. There it is right there. It's huge. So Rutherford, with that experiment, put the kiboshes to this model. It's gone. No, to be heard from no more. His nuclear model is now the one to be tested and worked on. Okay, so that was Rutherford's contribution. Now we have identified the, uh, the electrons and the positive particles now we call protons. And we knew that the protons were extremely massive compared to the electrons, but they had the same magnitude, but opposite charge. 
Okay, the problem with Rutherford's model is that it didn't go far enough. It only identified electrons and protons, but it didn't account for all the mass of the atom. There was more mass, especially for the larger atoms. There was more mass that couldn't be accounted for by electrons and protons. So a student, actually a research, uh, an employee, a researcher with Rutherford, his name was Chadwick. Um, well, actually, he was a graduate student. Sorry, he was a graduate student. Then, when he graduated, he, he was postdoc for Rutherford for a while. Then he went off on his own. But uh, they set about searching for uh, the rest of the mass. They knew the rest of the mass of the atom could not have a charge because if it had a charge, then it wouldn't be neutral anymore. So the particle they were looking for, they knew was neutral, and eventually they called it the neutron. We're not going to go into that experiment. Right now, I've already used up almost all but five more minutes. So the nuclear model, set, model says most of the mass of the atom is in the nucleus. And there are protons there and perhaps neutrons. The only one that only has a proton and no neutron is hydrogen. The rest of them all have neutrons in them. Okay, here we go. So there you go, relative sizes, right? The whole atom might be on the order of 10 to the minus eight centimeters, but the nucleus is 10 to the minus 13. That means five orders of magnitude difference in size. That is huge. Five orders of magnitude is like 100,000. Okay, now we come to Dalton's atomic theory that every atom of an element is identical to every other atom. Well, now that we know what atoms are made of, we know that um, elements are characterized by the number of protons. In other words, if you know the number of protons, then you know the element. It's, it's that specific. But you can have the same number of protons in this atom and that atom, and they have different numbers of neutrons. So they have different masses. But since they have the same number of protons and the same number of electrons in the neutral atom, they behave chemically the same way. Think about it. When two atoms come together, they're going to interact, right? What do they see first? They see electrons first. Okay. So um, we can't mess with the protons because it affects the electrons and the chemistry. You have a different element with a different number of protons. But you can have a different number of neutrons. And it, very, it so slightly affects chemistry that we can ignore it. All right. So um, let's see. We'll steal my own thunder, but I, I do want to give you something to think about between now and Thursday. Okay. We call those different mass atoms isotopes. So um, if you know anything about uh, uranium, right, we made a bomb out of it. You need a uranium that's 235 mass units. That's the one that fissions. That's the one you make bombs out of, or you make uh, power, electrical power. This one is another, right? It has three more neutrons than this one does, but it's, it's more stable. This one will fission in a heartbeat. Uh, just ask anybody that lived through Hiroshima. Anyway, I'm, I'm writing these in, in a notation that I haven't explained yet. So let me do that and then we'll leave. Uh, we'll go to the lab. So if this is the element, right? It can be any element, any element symbol. That, that explains element symbols yet. Okay. Wait a minute. Let me cheat. Look ahead. 
Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, let's. Every element in that table has a letter. Uh, if it only has one letter, it's capitalized. If it has two letters, the first one's capital and the second one's small letter. That's just showing you can tell them apart. Because if uh, hydrogen's got hydrogen, ah, hydrogen's got dibs on H. It came first. Helium was discovered later. So they both start with H. So how are we going to tell them apart? Well, you just add an E to the helium. So HE is helium. So this represents any one of those symbols. There are four positions around that symbol that are reserved for specific information. This position here is reserved for charge. So you'll say like uh, either a plus or a minus or a, a two plus or a two minus, that's the charge. Okay. Down here is the number of atoms. So if you have two atoms in a hydrogen molecule, you do it like that. Now, this is usually enough for chemistry. But if we're going to talk about the nuclear properties and, and, and say something about the nucleus of the atom, you need two more bits of information. This one over here is the atomic number. That's the number of protons. And we abbreviate it like that. This one is the mass number. And that's the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. Okay, so with that information, you can completely characterize an atom or an ion. Right? If it has a charge, it's no longer a neutral atom, it's an ion. <clears throat> so what I'm saying here is this is the mass number of that isotope versus that isotope. And since they have the same protons, 92, that means the only difference between this one and this one is three neutrons. This one has three extra neutrons. Okay, let's see. Should put that down just because the yeah, you know, just because the laser is pooped out on. There we go. So in this example. I'm going to run over just a little bit. In this example, we have 11, 11 protons and 12 neutrons for this isotope of sodium, whereas that isotope has one more neutron. Okay, They have basically the same chemistry because they have the same number of protons and the same number of electrons in the neutral atom. Remember, for a neutral atom, the number of protons has to equal the number of electrons. If you have an ion, a positive charge or a negative charge, you get that by changing the number of electrons, not the number of protons. If you change the number of protons, you got a different element. So you have to do it by balancing positive and negatives. And that means add negatives, subtract negatives. So in this case, um, we've got 11 protons for sodium. Sodium prefers a plus one charge, right? So if it's got 11 protons, then how is it gonna get a plus one charge? It has to lose an electron. So if it's got 11 electrons in neutral, then 10 electrons means it has a plus one charge. Okay. Um, let's see. I don't want to go any further. Okay, the next slide describes what I put on the board there a second ago. This would be a good place to, to break, and we'll come back. We'll come back Thursday and finish the story. <clears throat>